Well, hello and welcome to the Well After Hours. I'm so glad that you could join us today to have a wonderful conversation regarding voting rights and the cost of a lost vote. And to help me have this conversation today is my fantastic sister friend, Reverend Leslie Marie Wilson. Reverend Wilson, welcome back to the well. Thank you so much for taking time to be with me today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much for the invitation. You know, uh, since this is Black History Month and we are celebrating and honoring all of the sacrifices and all of the vast contributions to so many of our Black men and women who have, you know, helped and strived, struggled to get us to this point uh, where we should have liberty and justice for all, you know, but we're still fighting. And I, I was just reading this morning uh, about how back in 1957 uh, in his speech, give us the ballot uh, in DC, Dr. King called the right to vote one of the highest mandates of our democratic tradition. And yet 75 years later, the US is practically poised to step backward. Yes, it's um, the sad thing is, it, is that we are on a backwards trend. Unfortunately, when we look at what's going on right now, we have, you know, over half of the states that have put forth legislation um, that would restrict that would put barriers in the way to access to voting. Um, this, is, this is not something that is new. It's something that's been going on. It's, it's, it's the only thing that's different now is that we have technology that helps to facilitate the coordination of anti-voting laws. Um, but the good news is we also have technology to facilitate the education of these restrictions, the educations of any expansions so that our people can be fully equipped. Because I, when I've been, I've been doing this work for over 30 years, working specifically with um, black churches and pastors on social justice through civic engagement, civic engagement and voting rights. And one of the things that's important about that is um, I've always said that I look at this as a Genesis 50-20 plan. When man intended for harm, God intends for good. So every time one of these laws come up, it, gets, it might get in the way, it might hinder, it might cause some inconvenience, but we know, again, that God intends for good and look at what happened, for example, in 2020, when we had one of the largest voter turnouts during a pandemic, during a pandemic, people showed up, they turned out and they voted because they understood that there is an importance in their voice being heard, being amplified and not being silent. So what Dr. King said then in the 50s is absolutely true today. And we have to make sure that each generation hears the words of the past, but also what's being said in the present to make sure, again, that they recognize there is not one thing that connects to our life that is not connected to the ballot. If somebody knows of something, I would ask them, Beverly, to tell me because I have yet to find out any one something that connects to our daily life where there has not been a vote made by somebody, where, there, where somebody hasn't been voted into a position and made an appointment where no matter what it is, we're, we're there. And so it makes a difference. It is one of the most important human rights. It's a human right. It is a civil right, but civil rights can be legislated. Mm. Human rights says that as a human being, it is an innate part of who I am to participate in my government, in the democracy. And I say democracy, I'm not saying Democrat. I'm saying a democracy, which is a representative government that, it, that, that uh, comes into play by people voting for who they want in government. 
Wow. You know, after viewers have heard you just begin to open up your, you know, our conversation on this issue, and we're going to get even deeper into it. I want to, they probably have a better idea, but I want to let them know why you are here today. I just want to share a little bit of your background <laughs> so the viewers can know why you're here and uh, how well versed you are on this subject. I want to tell you a little bit about Reverend Leslie uh, Marie Wilson. She is the Director of African American Religious Affairs at People for the American Way and People for the American Way Foundation. And she's representing 2,200 men and women from various Christian traditions across the country. And the AARA endeavors to build a strong association of progressive clergy, theologians, seminarians, and ministry lay leaders who encourage African-American churches and communities to become more civically engaged and promote social justice programs and policies. And may I also say she is also the first lady of St. Matthew AME Church in Orange, <laughs> New Jersey, where the Reverend uh, <laughs> Melvin Wilson is the senior pastor and their church is just so progressive and doing so many wonderful things. And it, 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 it serves to have a dynamic first lady like this <laughs> in a church. But, but I also want to say that she's recognized by the Center for American Progress as one of 15 faith leaders to watch in 2015. And Reverend Wilson is the former national policy director for Bomb and Gilead and served for nine years as the director of the Multicultural Programs Department of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. She also served as the national coordinator and field director for the National Rainbow Push Coalition. Reverend Wilson is a master trainer and has provided, as she stated, training to over 25,000 leaders within the African American faith community for over 28 years. And Reverend Wilson's work has been featured in a number of national outlets, including NBC, Cosmopolitan, and the Huffington Post. So there you have a little bit of takeaway on why Reverend Wilson is the perfect candidate to speak to this issue. And, you know, um, I was saying, thinking about, you know, where that stand is and the filibuster uh, issue. Could you talk to viewers a little bit about that? Because I don't think uh, people understand sometimes what the filibuster did to this boat and how it actually works. The filibuster is, we call it an, an ancient relic uh, that comes out of Jim Crow. What it is, is a time when, and you, you see it in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate, where a senator will, art, will debate, will argue, will stand and talk for as long as he or she chooses to for and against, and often it's used against a particular piece of, of legislation that has been introduced that's being presented for, um, for a vote consideration. We just saw this um, last month in, uh, in the debate that was taking place when we were, uh, we have been working for the last couple of years to get, the, get federal protections for voting rights. Why is federal protection important? Because again, you've got all these state legislatures that have been putting forth all of this legislation to hinder access, to make put more barriers, to do more voter intimidation, to just, to just make it harder to vote, which is absolutely ridiculous. In, in 2022, it was ridiculous in 1965 until we got the Voting Rights Act, and it's ridiculous today. But the, the filibuster is a way to, to stop progress from things from moving forward. Again, you get it, they get into this debate and they state their position and you will have, I, I can't even remember right now, I should have been prepared for that question, you know, that there has been, uh, people have, have actually stood on the Senate floor mm -hmm. and argued against things for some, I think the longest was like 22, 23 hours when you had a Senator to do this. But they, it, it is a tool um, that, that gets in the way of progress. And again, what, we've, what, has, what has happened recently, um, you saw how the Senate will change the rules when it's convenient for them, depending upon 
who is the majority. They will either uh, change the rules so that uh, you you can't do a filibuster, or you can do you can do a filibuster, or they, there's so many different pieces to this. I don't want to get yeah, so it's true. It's just it. yeah. But again, the bottom line is that it's a tool that's used most often. It's been used since it, they, we say it's a Jim Crow relic because it was one of the tools that was used early on yeah. to mm-hmm. prevent voting rights, to prevent human rights, to prevent civil rights for African-Americans, for per- free persons, persons who had been enslaved. And so it comes out of that, you all know the Jim Crow laws that were in effect that we still say are here today, that again, don't do anything to help us to move forward as a people. Don't do anything to fully recognize us as citizens, as first-class citizens of this country. Doesn't do anything to help us to feel more uh, more patriotic, more American. It doesn't do anything. All it does is to discriminate, to discourage, to again be used to uh, to get people to dishearten people from participating in the process. So when a filibuster comes up, as it did when we were trying to get passage for the the freedom the the Freedom to Vote Act mm-hmm. and the John S. Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would have provided pre- federal protection, which would have protected our voting rights. Ours, yes, us people of color, Black folks, but also for persons um, who have disabilities, for, for Indigenous people in this country, for women, for persons whose ID may not um, agree with their, um, with their, their gender, um, their gender identification may be different on their their photo, on their driver's license or something, but so many different communities were are impacted by voter restriction laws. And so we needed to have federal legislation. And I wanna applaud um, the president for stepping out and saying that this was one of his priorities was to get federal legislation passed I want to applaud um, Senator Chuck Schumer for his leadership in the Senate of trying to drive this forward. We did not get the vote. We ended up, again, people think that voting rights is dead at the federal level, but it is absolutely not. The fight goes on. The fight will continue. Your voice is still needed to be heard by your senators um, and also to push the White House. But the filibuster is one of those things that we just have to figure out a way to get rid of it. Um, and to, you know, again, we have some senators who will change the rules on it, some senators who do not. We've got people in our in our network who say they don't want the rules to be changed on the filibuster. They want it to stand, but it doesn't do us any good in the long run when it does stand. Again, it gets in the way of progress. And so that's the main thing that I want people to know is that um, you can, I mean, people can Google this all they want to, and they can see how it's been used and, and, and to manipulate um, progress. Yes. But it's a tool that's used to get in the way of voting of, of any kind of, it's not just voting rights. It could be workers' rights. It could be women's rights, whatever it is. It's, it's just a tool, a tactic mm-hmm. that, that gets exploited. Wow. And, and, you know, thank you so much for setting that record straight on that issue. But, you know, you would think that um, for the, you know, the Freedom to Vote Act that John Lewis, you know, uh, worked so untiringly to uh, see it move forward with all the things that are like the, the key elements that they would want it because it really does protect the vote. If that's what they say they're out to do is to protect voting, (laughs) you know, to make sure that the vote uh, can go forward without scrutiny and all that. Why wouldn't you want this passed? You know, except you only have your agenda, that one agenda, and that is to hinder and to obstruct (laughs) for a certain Mm -hmm. group of people Mm -hmm. because they know that people will actually turn out regardless of rain. <laughs> the harder they make it, the, the more people are determined. <laughs> Sometimes what, the harder things are, it seems like we really show up in the hardest of times. Absolutely. 
You know? Again, Genesis 50, 20, what man intends for yes. harm, God intends for good. Mm-hmm. Yes, he speaks to us. And, and you're absolutely right. It is, it, that it is a critical question that we need to ponder all the time. Why would somebody want to put forth something that would get in the way of, one of, of you exercising one of the most fundamental rights of citizenship in, in this country, that's in our constitution. Why would somebody want to do that? And then, but you have to recognize the reality mm-hmm. because they are afraid, afraid, because they are insecure, because at the end of the day, those persons are cowards. Mm-hmm. They, are, they, do not un, they do not want to have a so-called minority group to end up becoming the majority and having its voice louder than theirs when it comes to public policy, when it comes to, again, making sure that we are doing what's, what's, what's noble and good for our fellow woman and man, as opposed for our fellow neighbors, as opposed to us having, as opposed to, again, putting up something that is going to end up um, discouraging, disrespecting, uh, discriminating against. Why would somebody want to do that? Uh, you know, we could say just because they're mean, nasty, and evil, we could say that. Um, we could say that they're, you know, the devil's imps and then they're, they're being used by that. But these are smart people. And they, and this what, what I want um, folks to recognize is that this is an intentional strategy. Strategy. This is nothing that we see just happens. This is people who, these are people who have put millions of dollars, billions of dollars into doing whatever they can, again, to to lessen your power, to lessen our power, to take our power away. Voter suppression, I I want people to understand it as a strategy to influence the outcome of an election by discouraging Mm. or preventing people from exercising their right to vote. That's voter suppression. It is a strategy that attempts to reduce the number of voters who might vote against somebody's candidate or a proposition that they're advocated for. So this is really important for folks to remember a strategy. God had a strategy when he sent Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There was a strategy in place. There was a strategy in place from Genesis to Revelation. So things don't just happen just because it appears so. When you have, again, over 200 pieces of legislation that has been introduced, and I want, I, I, I should have it in front of me. Oh, I think it was like 32 states recently, according to the Brennan Research Center, that would, again, take deny access. It would eliminate certain things like the ballot box. It would eliminate things like same day voting. It puts restrictions on vote by mail, like in Texas, where they want you to actually put a copy of your driver's license or your social security number in your application for, in in your request for a vote by mail application, which is ridiculous when we have, what do we have going on nowadays? We have ID theft that's happening. How could somebody actually think that someone would, would, would do that, would agree to do that? Again, Mm -hmm. under the barriers. So you don't request a vote, um, um, an absentee ballot. You decide not to vote by mail. And what happens if you're one of those people who finds themselves unable to vote on election day because something has happened, something that you knew about that, that was planned. Forget about what's not planned. But this is the this is a good question, and our folks need to ponder it all the time. When we ask the question, why vote? Why vote? Why vote? is because somebody mm-hmm. is spending an awful lot of time and energy and money to keep you from voting. Mm-hmm. So that means that your vote counts, that your voice counts. That means that whatever issues, personalities, candidate, whatever it may be that you are standing for, somebody out there is against and they want you to be, and they want to discourage you again, from participating in the system. We cannot allow that to happen. We cannot, and because every election, because you know what, imagine every 
election matters. Elections happen all the time and every election matters. The local, the city elections matter, the state matters, the federal elections matter. So elections are happening all the time and all the time we've got to be ready to vote. We've got to move beyond apathy. We've got to move beyond again, this, this, um, this psyche of my vote doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Again, if it didn't matter, if it mm-hmm. doesn't count, if it, if it was a problem with counting, then you would not see laws coming on the book where they are actually trying to keep, where they're actually trying to have, it's partisan, but they're actually trying to have like state legislators to count the votes as opposed to having nonpartisan um, mm-hmm. electoral workers to do it. Why is it important? Because they are afraid because mm-hmm. of what they saw happen in 2020 elections. Mm-hmm. I tell you, yeah. you brought up such a, a, a another point that I had wanted to, to hit on in, uh, as, as far as the elections on every level. You know, from a lower level to the 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 council persons to the mayors to you know, and up, we need to be involved in everything because if those people, I mean, the perfect examples. Look at how they are outnumbered. The Democrats are outnumbered. You know, uh, in, in many of the places, except for thank goodness, the House of Representatives, they have you know a, a majority uh, in in that area. But we need. Um, more senators and people who will back up the people we put in office. So as we go up higher and higher, they're not there. I mean, the president, the, the presidential race is, is great, yes, but if he doesn't have enough of the people below him <laughs> that are in his uh, corner that are voting like, you know, for him, he can't operate like he would normally like to. And I think that's something that we all need to understand too, is that we have to put people uh, in there that are going to vote as he asked them to vote, you know, for the things to get things done and achieved. We need folks who are gonna speak to our values, the things that we care about when they are elected. I don't care if it's an election for a dog catcher, if it's an election for the water commissioner, every one of those positions make a difference again in our daily lives. It's one of the things that I, the thing that I have been doing um, again for all these years, I do nonpartisan work. I can't tell people who to vote for. Mm -hmm. And legally, pastors cannot tell people who to vote for. But what I can tell people is to vote. And what I can do is to equip them with the information they need to make good, conscious decisions about who they want to have represented in those elected positions and positions where there will be appointment appointments. So when somebody says, well, I don't need to vote in the president's election, it's not gonna make any difference. Well, it makes a difference because look at what we have right now. The president gets to nominate those persons who end up getting on our courts. And many of these are lifetime positions, especially mm-hmm. on the federal court. What, has, what do we have right now? President Biden has, uh, has nominated, will nominate the first African-American female, the first Black woman ever to the Supreme Court. That matters. Mm-hmm. So if you were somebody who the courts matter to you, you would be looking at your senators because they are going to be the ones that will be involved in the nomination process mm-hmm. that will advance that will either vote for the candidate or against the candidate. You will look at the president and the candidate and who the nominee is. He's got some wonderful, very talented, dynamic black women that he is considering right now, that he is interviewing right now that we're very excited about. He should be hearing from us to say, if you voted for him, then you say to him, I voted for you and it's important to me that you put a qualified, a a undeniable, uh, excellent woman of integrity, black woman of integrity on the Supreme Court, that you keep your campaign promise. So when we talk about our our voting, when we talk about the, the elections, when you look at your mayor, your mayor, your city council, they put forward your but the city budgets 
they some of them are the reasons why you end up with those with those referendums that say, oh, we want to have a half cent tax to be so that we can work on the roads so that we can improve our school system. And and quite often, unfortunately, we only look at the top and not the bottom of mm -hmm. the ballot. Mm -hmm. we, we should go from the bottom up because it makes a difference that half cent. If it's talking about improving the roads, uh, that might be the roads on the other side of the railroad track. I'm from Louisiana. We had yeah. railroad tracks that kind of divided us. Mm -hmm. And so that may be for the other side of the railroad tracks and not my side. And mm -hmm. I need to be concerned about that. So I need to know whether I'm voting, how to vote yes or no on a ballot initiative. I need to be educated about what's important. School board right now, with the debate happening around critical race theory, with them banning books. Can you believe that we've got a state that actually wants to ban Michelle Obama's book Becoming? Mm -hmm. Critical mm -hmm. race theory. So whoever is sitting on the, on the school boards right now, whoever is sitting in the state legislature, they are people who are going to be making the decision about how Black history is taught. Can you imagine talking about the Civil War and not talking about slavery? Can you imagine talking about the U.S. Constitution and not talking about the reconstruction, not talking about reconstruction or the reconstruction amendments, the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment? Why can't we talk about it? Because we don't want some white child to become embarrassed, to feel ashamed to feel bad because his or her forefathers, ancestors were um, were the ones that that uh, treated black people as anything but human beings. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that were part of the tragedy. They were the ones that that are part of the hurt that we still suffer today. But they are saying now that certain people, it's a movement that's happening around the country that we can't teach that. We can't teach the black history that again, that it could be something that's in your state that has happened that can't, you can't lift up your heroes. We can't talk about the abolitionists because we'll hurt somebody's feelings. Well, my feelings are hurt all the time when I see Confederate flags, when I see them uplift, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Or, anyway, the elections, at all levels, every office, no matter what it is, we should be aware of when the voter registration deadline is so that if you haven't registered, you can. You should, so that if you are registered, that you have your, the information is correct. So you need to be aware of when the deadline happens. You need to be aware of what's on the ballot. You need to be aware of when the election day occurs. What are the hours that things will open up? Will you have drop boxes available to you or will you only, you know, be able to <laughs> in person? Can you do vote by mail or absentee um, voting on this election? Elections, all elections matter. They happen all the time and all the time we have to be ready to vote. You know what, and going back to what you stated about, uh, you know, the, the CRT and uh, education, for years, our children have had to sit in classrooms and hear from their perspective what they wanted to teach them. How do you think they felt talking about slavery? Absolutely. <laughs> and and Absolutely. nobody said anything about that. But you know what, because, you know, they know it will have the reverse effects on 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 their culture as well as on what happened on earth i mean that's the testament right there what it actually did and does why they don't want it to you know why they won't propose that to happen is because right. what happened and what it did <laughs> the the after effects are are crucial they know that and uh they just like i heard uh, over the weekend how they were saying um, uh, about an issue that happened on one of the talk shows and um, they brought more to the forefront, the awareness of, you know, Jewish history. They don't want the Holocaust taught. They don't want to talk, right. talk about what happened to indigenous <laughs> indigenous people, people in this country. Yeah. And That's so right. they don't want anything talked about that kind of, I guess, denigrates them. <laughs> That's right. And it's only truth though. 
But how, right. you, how can you talk about the history of this country, as you said, without bringing that in? You're not telling the whole truth. You're giving every us decade, ever since this, the 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 the, um, the pilgrims, they colonized every every there had there is so much wrong that was done in the founding and the establishment of this country that is still being done. I mean, one of the one of the reasons why this is such a an, a, a serious issue is because teachers had to start talking about. George Floyd. Teachers had to start talking about Black Lives Matter, had to start talking about what was going on, why were people protesting? And, and this was not, this is this isn't the 60s. We're not talking about something that had, we're talking about something that is recent, that is current. And so what happens? Well, we you gotta say, well, we talk about police brutality because of the numbers, the statistics, what we see happen to black men in their interaction with law enforcement. We see what happens to black women. We have seen, we've got the names of, there are so many names that we can't even count on. We know the, the, the ones that have um, received national attention, but there are so many that haven't received any attention at all. Some that you may even know that were local to your own neighborhood. But these, but I'm saying these people, and when I say these people, let me be very specific. I'm talking about white conservatives. I'm talking about conservative evangelicals. I'm talking about those individuals who, again, do not see or want to, who are, in, who are themselves intimidated, who are themselves insecure, who are themselves fearful of the truth being told. Like that, that movie said, you don't, they can't handle the truth. They don't want to see themselves, especially those who are, who are called Christians. They want to, don't want it to be known that they participated in some of the atrocities that took place in this country toward other people, toward other races, other ethnicities, other nationalities. Yes, for me as a black person, I am very focused on what happened to my people. I'm from the South. There are still remnants of some of the things that happen in the South. There are still places where there are plantations where they celebrate the, the field and the houses, the shacks where, 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 where um, human beings live, where Black people live, because it, that didn't have, um, that weren't warm enough, that weren't cold, that weren't warm enough in the winter, that really didn't provide anything for them. There's so much we can't, I can't talk about, when I talk about soul food, I have to talk about the origins of soul food. How did we get to soul food? Well, our ancestors used to make what they could make with what they had available to them. And that's what, that's what they did. They had, whether it was the leftovers or whether it was the, the weeds or whether it was whatever it was, they used what they had and it became comforting. It became a part of our culture that we didn't have to necessarily rely upon the white man to provide everything for us, that we could do some things on our own. I just want people to, to understand, again, if they are not part of the electoral process, if they are not voting, if they are not keeping themselves informed, yes, there are a lot of issues that are going on. Absolutely. A lot of things that are happening that that can overwhelm us. When you just look at the at the six o'clock news every day, you've got crime, you've got the tensions with Russia, you've got COVID now. You know, there's so much that's happening. You again have um, have internal stuff that you've got scandals that are going. There's so much that's going on, and that doesn't include what's happening in your own life. But I, but you've got to make room to be informed, to know what's happening so that you can speak from an informed position. And how do you speak? You speak at a school board meeting, you speak at a council meeting, you go and visit your state legislature, you go to visit your congressperson, you write a letter, you put a post on there um, on your Facebook or Twitter or whatever you have. But it is important that you equip yourself so that you know what's happening in the world, 
so that you can speak from an informed position and then you vote from an informed position. You don't just go out and say, I'm just going to vote because I'm a Democrat. I'm just going to vote because I'm Green Party. I'm just going to vote because I'm a Republican. You are voting because you know something, your values are being addressed, the issues that, that are important to you are being addressed, and you support the democratic process. Hmm. Well, you know, and, and a lot, there's a lot. You you open up a whole whole <laughs> mess of stuff. There's so much stuff in here. Wow. I know, and you know, and, and it's wonderful to know that you know you do actually do that. That people, and we're going to put up all the information for you viewers um, because you may. Uh, want to have Reverend Wilson come because she does do training and can speak and say and address many of the things you may not want to address to your groups that she can come in and say she can kind of do like a hit and run as they say as the preacher say well I'm gonna come <laughs> preach I don't have to stay here I'm gonna hit and run but at least she can come in there and and and, and really you know, point out the the necessity and especially in these times how crucial it is to value the vote. Because, you know, we were talking, I was saying the topic of this whole conversation was on voting rights, but it's about the cost of a lost vote, you know? It, yeah. it, the cost yeah. is too great. Too much blood has been shed. Too many sacrifices right. have been made for us to get to this point, to go backwards now, you know? And we do have to um, take it Seriously, we can't be, you know, do anything lightly anymore. It has to be, as Reverend Wilson said, intentional, you know, and there are ways that uh, I think that uh, we can help. And I don't know, uh, Reverend Wilson, you can uh, speak to that of viewers who may be interested in because you do training. And you I can train, train people. You can. Would you would you tell the viewers a little bit about the training that you do and what what that involves? Yeah, thank you. I one of the things um, that I am so blessed and and I I love God for this this ministry that that He has given to me of equipping, and that is equipping around social justice and civic engagement. And when I talk about civic engagement, when I'm doing training, I want people to, to recognize that I'm talking about three, ask three things here. I'm talking about voter empowerment. I'm talking about and how do we get voter empowerment? It's important that we support uh, civic organizations. So you should be a dues paying member of an AC ACLU of a people for the uh, pe people for the American way of the NAACP legal defense fund. You should actually be investing in organizations that are investing in promoting and securing your rights in this country. That's important because the other side, the enemy, the conservatives, the fundamentalists, they support financially their side. Mm -hmm. That's how you see so many commercials. That how, that's how you see so many conferences happening. That's how you see so many organizations that put forth model legislation, such as the American Legislative Exchange Council, that, that, conservative, that conservatives become mem conservative legislators become members of. They get this legislation, and then it ends up being, again, what we have now, close to 200 pieces of anti-voter legislation. So the first thing when I train is to, I want people to think about how to financially support organizations that are supporting, that are advocating, that are lobbying for their interests. So the second thing is to recognize that when we talk about electoral politics in our trainings and the trainings that I do, I talk about electoral candidate, I talk about two types of, of, of uh, elections there are what's on the ballot. There is the candidate, and then there is the ballot initiative or the citizens initiative. It's that thing at the bottom of the ballot that sometimes we miss. Again, when we, it may be um, legalization of marijuana. It may be a, a tax. It may be, um, uh, what are some of the things that, again, it could anything, be you know, yes, many anything. Things. And so you've got that. So I talk about those two issues and make sure when we're talking about that, we talk about 
not so when I talk about the candidate, it's not talk, I'm not talking party. I'm talking about the candidate who speaks again to your values, yes. to the issues that you hold important, whether it's Medicaid, education, whatever it may be. And then the third thing that we talk about at the training is how to be an advocate, how you can be an advocate for your community, for your family, for the issue that you're concerned about. If you are concerned about student loans and you need to, how do you become an advocate for student loans, for um, the movement right now that is to eliminate the student loan debt that so many people have hanging over them? How do you become an advocate for healthcare when people are trying to, when we've got so many people that are sick nowadays and you've got other people who are trying to take away healthcare benefits or trying to reduce Medicaid, Medicare, mm -hmm. and trying to actually eliminate the Affordable Care Act, which is known as Obamacare. So how do you become an advocate? How do you write letters? How do you petition folks? How do you, how do you have convene in your kitchen a meeting of two or more to be gathered and to come together? And yes, we're going to have Bible study, but we're also going to spend a little bit of time educating ourselves about something that's happening in our community. If I'm concerned about guns in the community, I need to be aware of what the gun laws are in the state, who's supporting reduction, eliminating, and who's supporting adding more uh, or lesser restrictions on, on gun ownership. You know, do I support the Second Amendment? And if I do, how do where do I show that? So, so we're talking about civic membership, we're talking about electoral campaigns. And we're talking about advocacy. Our training is, the, is around how do we ask, ask. A is increasing awareness. S is increasing your skills, either becoming an organizer or a better communicator. And K is increasing your knowledge about what it is that's important to you. And again, how do you talk about it? How do you talk about it based upon the laws that have been written, based upon what somebody has said, based upon what the Bible may say to you mm -hmm. about a particular issue. So our trainings go, I, I train on everything from organizing to voting to um, right now getting ready to talk about the importance of the courts, courting the courts, why we should be vocal and visible about this Supreme Court nominee. So there's all kinds of trainings and all of the trainings are faith-based. All of them are biblical, like give you tools from the Bible that you will be able to use. Again, like you hear me, you've heard me said earlier, Genesis 50, 20. Why is that important? Because man is putting forth some evil things out there. They're talking evil, they're doing evil, but we cannot hide, we cannot run away. We have to know that what man intends for harm, God intends for evil. God mm -hmm. intends for good. Yes. Why? Because we are Romans 828 witnesses. Mm -hmm. All things work together for good for those of us who love the Lord and who are called. And so that so that kind of training, um, again, and I I do congregational training, I do denominational training, ministerial alliance training. Um, I speak to just the women, I can speak to mixed groups to young people, I'm available. Um, that's my ministry. That's what God has gifted me with. And which, you know, again, I thank him every day because every time I look, even when I'm preparing a sermon, my sermons have some sort of training aspect to it so that you get the word of God. You get the, you get the, you get Matthew 28, 19, the commission of God, but you also, and you get some kind of tool that you are able to go forth and to do as a Christian, as a believer, as an activist, as an, you know, Jesus was an activist, you know, Jesus was an activist, but how do we do that? That's important to how it gets done is, is one of the things I pray about all the time and that the Holy Spirit shares with me how to help people get things done that is, that will improve their life, the life of their family, the life of the community, the life of our country. Amen. I tell you, whew, you I, I, I wanted to take a, a quick little break for the viewers to just see some portions of how you have been actively involved and pushing forward, you know, in the vote for voters' rights, something we put together. I want them to see that um, so they can see you're actually talking 
you know, you're walking the talk, as they say. You're not just, <laughs> you're not just saying this. I want them to see you in action. And so don't go away. We're just going to allow you to see a little glimpse into um, what Reverend Wilson has been doing, you know, down through the times and how involved she's been. So we'll be right back. So just stay watch. One day when the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours. Oh, one day when the war is won, we will be sure. To the heavens, no man, no weapon Formed against, yes, glory is destined Everyday women and men become legends Sins that go against our skin become blessings The movement is a rhythm to us Freedom is like religion to us Justice is juxtaposition in us Justice for all just ain't specific enough One son died, the spirit is revisiting us True and living, living in us Resistance is us That's why Rosa sat on the bus That's why we walked through Ferguson with our hands up When it go down, we woman and man up They say stay down and we stand up Shots, we on the ground, the camera panned up King pointed to the mountaintop and we ran up One day when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours, oh, no. glory, glory, oh. Every man, woman, and child Even Jesus got his crown in front of a crowd They march with the torch, we gon' run with it now Never look back, we done gone hundreds of miles From dark roads, heroes, to become a hero Facing the league of justice, his power was the people Enemy is lethal, a king became regal Saw the face of Jim Crow under a ball Well, I'm sure, viewers, you enjoyed seeing, you know, the activities of Reverend Wilson in all that she's doing and has some of what she has done. We couldn't put it all on footage, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse to see some of what she's done to know how serious and how personally and passionate she is about this, you know, and uh, I pray that, you know, many viewers will be stirred to passion to understand, you know, that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind. And this is not a time to be hopeless because the fact of where we are now should give us all the hope in the world because if it had not been for the Lord that was on our side, we would have been consumed by all the evils and things that we have faced. What our, what our foreparents and people had to go through to get us to where we are now, it's nobody but God. Just as, as the Jewish nation says that they know that it was because of their God that they exist today. Our existence is only explained by God. So uh, we, we have plenty of hope. And I know Reverend Wilson, as, as we even begin to close out this, you can give some the viewers some hope too <laughs> as, as we close out this conversation, which has been so enlightening, so informative, you know, and so motivating, I trust, you know, to even to people of faith to know that, you know, we have the right to be involved. And, you know, it's, there's a mandate for us to be involved. <laughs> there is a mandate. It's um, my, the work that, that I do at People for the American Way, God has blessed me to, um, as I said, the work is faith-based. So my work is, is actually rooted in um, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9, and it's a very familiar text. Um, New King James Version says, but we have this, well, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, yes. that the excellence of, 
the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side. Why vote? Because we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Thanks be to God. Why vote? Because we are perplexed, but not in despair. Thanks be to God. Why vote? Because we are persecuted, but not forsaken. Thanks be to God. Struck down, but not destroyed. We have the same spirit of faith according to what is written. I believe and therefore I spoke. One of the ways for me to speak is to definitely proclaim, claim for everyone to know that I am a Christian, that I am a, a blood-bought believer in Christ. But and as a Christian, I know that God had get, has given me, some people think that they gave me the right to vote, but they did not. God gave me the right to vote. God made it happen. And it is a blessing from the Lord. And this blessing is intended for us to use, to not abuse, to not forsake. We are vessels full of his power. And when we speak his word, when we speak with, through his blessing that is the right to vote, we make a difference in, the live, in our lives and in the lives of others. And so be encouraged. Do not be discouraged about, again, some of the negatives that's happening out there. Pray with us and pray for us that we create, that we are able to, to come up with the tactics that will, that will defeat the filibuster that's intended to block and to delay action on a bill. We don't need to have the filibuster, again, when it comes to certain basic rights for, for us as human beings, for us as citizens of this country. No things that you have to know before you go to the polls. And I, and I just, I guess I will close with um, the prayer that I wrote for, uh, my program is called Vessels Vote. I am a vessel and I vote. I am a vessel and I vote. Vessels, we are vessels full of power. We believe and we speak with our vote. And what, what do I pray that, this is a prayer, it's called a prayer for courage. And I will end with this if I can. Father, let nothing I have done or said get in the way of hearing my prayer for courage on election day, whenever election happens, to get up, to get out, and to go vote. Lord, I pray that you will grant me the courage to stand in the voting booth for those who can't, with those who are, for my values, and speak with my vote. Sometimes I feel cast down in times like these. But we have this treasure, your word says, in earthen vessels, that the excellence of power may be of you, God, and not of us. We are hard pressed, but thank you, not crushed. Perplexed, but thank you, not in despair. Persecuted, but thank you, not forsaken. Struck down, but thank you for not being destroyed. My hope and my trust is in you, Lord. I am a vessel filled with your power. Thank you for leading the way from the pulpit to the pew, to the people, to the polls, for the power to be expressed and the celebration of the victory of voting, of being a good steward of one of your blessings. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I tell you, that was so timely because I was going to ask you to close out with prayer, but you have done it. Thank God. I tell you, this has just been a tremendous blessing and uh, an eye-opening even experience for those who uh, may have taken the vote lightly uh, and didn't understand all of the you know, relevancy in it. But um, I thank God for your taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much, Reverend Wilson. And, thank uh, you very much. I, I look forward- On the wall. <laughs> love it. I love, I love it. I love it. And uh, viewers, I'm, I'm sure that you were blessed tremendously. And I hope that you will even share this and, and, and replay it, you know, for others who may not have seen this particular segment on the well and to hear Reverend Wilson um, uh, really have this conversation because I think it's just inspiring and motivating. And so ever, like I tell you, every Thursday, you got to come to the well and you'll be refreshed. You'll get something that's going to feed you and help you and to strengthen you. Uh, and and you, as Reverend Wilson said, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Don't look at the situation. Look at your God. Because <laughs> all the people who made it through, they made it through. Not looking at the situation or the circumstances, but they kept their eyes 
on the Lord. So we're going to do that, Reverend Wilson, and we look forward to uh, other conversations with you in the future. And viewers, we look for you to join us to have other conversations with us. And we just say until the next time at the well, God bless you. We'll see you soon. God bless you.